I'm going to talk now about uh, a class of bodies which, with which we're becoming increasingly familiar and which are used for all sorts of purposes in ordinary life. They're the artificially made bodies which we call plastics. And along with them, I want to talk about rubbers, because as we shall see, there are many features in common between plastics and rubbers, rubber-like bodies. They're comparatively new. It's really the last 15 or 20 years that they've come into their own, these plastics. You can make for them materials with all sorts of exciting new properties. And to a very large extent, they are replacing uh, metal and glass, for instance, particularly in objects we use in the home. I remember not so very long ago how people said how wonderful it would be if at some time uh, we could find a kind of unbreakable glass, something which had the good properties of glass but which didn't break. Well, look at these two things baby's bottles. There's an old-fashioned baby's bottle, a glass baby's bottle, and we all know the nonchalant kind of way in which a baby, when it finished with its article, uh, used to toss it out of its pram if it wasn't watched carefully, preferably on a really hard pavement like this. Now, here is a modern baby's bottle, much lighter, just as good and strong, but we can dash that down on anything and it is absolutely unbreakable. A baby-proof bottle, if you like. Here's another example. Fabrics. Smokers know what a nuisance it is uh, when they get reproved because they've let little uh, bright ashes drop. Uh, from their pipes onto their coats and burnt small holes. Well, here is a fabric. It's a fabric mostly of carbon, a kind of cloth. I'll light that bus burner, and if I hold the fabric in the flame, by means of this, these pincers, you will see I can heat it red hot, even white hot, at the tips there, without, and when I let it cool down, nothing's happened. It hasn't burnt away at all. What's the secret of these new bodies, these wonderful new bodies, which we call plastics? They're not really new. Nature has known the trick for a long time. Horn and hoof, leather, plastics. Our fingernails are made of plastic, as you might guess, perhaps. There's a little plastic factory at the bottom of the nail, which is continually producing it, as we say, the nail slowly grows. And then plants produce plastics too. Cellulose is a plastic. It forms such substances as cotton and flax, which have long been used. What has happened is that chemists have now found the trick to make these plastics in the way that nature does. What is their structure? They all have the same essential property. You start with extremely simple chemical molecules, quite small ones, so small that they can be in the, make up a liquid or even a gas. And then, by some chemical reaction, they are strung together into long strings or three-dimensional arrays to make what are called macromolecules, gigantic molecules, tens of thousands of them in each string or blob. These little puppet beads illustrate the principle. You know how you can make a necklace out of puppet beads. I've got one of these little pop beads here. And as you know, it's got a little ball at one end and a socket at the other. So if I take another pop bead, I can press the ball of one into the socket of the other and so go on and make as long a string as I like, as has been done there. 
Now, that's the nature of a plastic, then. It's just a vast body made of simple chemical units by some chemical trick which makes them join together. If you've only got two places of joining, as you have in the puppet beads, you can make strings of them. If you have more than two places where they can join up, you can, of course, join them sideways as well and make a kind of three-dimensional structure out of your units. Another analogy, another plastic making we're familiar with is, say, the drain rods, where the man has a whole series of rods, one with a screw, each rod has a screw at one end and a socket at the other, and by joining them on in long lengths, he makes a macromolecular drain rod, as long as he likes to push down the pipe or the chimney sweep to push up the chimney. Well, now let's look at an actual plastic. Here's the very simplest of the lot, and yet it's one with which we are quite so familiar. It's a plastic called polythene, and this illustrates the trick of making a plastic in a very, uh, in a very convenient way. This rather crude model, for instance, represents a molecule of ethylene. Uh, there's supposed to be a carbon atom there, a carbon atom there. Carbon always has four bonds. It uses two of them to join it to these two hydrogens here, and its other two are used to join it to its neighboring carbon atom. Now, of course, one of these bonds uh, is superfluous. We could do without it. Have a single bond joining one carbon to another. And under extreme heat and pressure, that's what happens. These bonds break like that. If you imagine a number of molecules in which these bonds have been broken by heat and pressure, then when they're allowed to join up again, one can join to the next. They can use these bonds in this way. So you see, we can build up out of these ethylene molecules a long chain and a wriggly one because it can twist around all these joints here. Now here's a rather more realistic model of it where the sizes of the atoms have been shown, the space they take up, is nice and straight and regular there, but in the same way, it can wriggle about in all directions because the carbon atoms can turn around these joints. So, if you look at an actual piece of polythene, I've got one here, a rod of polythene, you must imagine it a kind of string tangle of these long chains running and wriggling about in all directions, looping up with each other. And here's a way which, to my mind, always makes these chains in the polythene interlocking like this seem rather real. Suppose you have a lot of interlocking chains, like a tangled mass of pop bead chains, or tangle of string, or anything of that kind. As it is like this, it's quite easily deformable. But if I take it and try to pull it out, it always goes a certain distance and no further, like that, you see. Take it in another shape. Of course, because the loops of the chains or the loops of the string get over and inside each other and stop it from expanding still further. Well, that is a property which we can also see in the polythene and we'll illustrate it by an experiment. Mr. Coates here has rope of this polythene, and you will see that as he pulls it out, this rod of polythene, it narrows, it necks and narrows. He can pull it out to a certain extent, but then it comes to a dead stop and just stays at a certain thickness. And you can see the neck running along as the thick parts turn into the thin parts, and the tangles pull out as far as they'll go. Well, now, let's make a plastic. I've... Uh, talked so far, the case of polythene, that very simple one, of pressure and temperature turning the simple molecules into these long chains of a plastic. You remember the temperature breaks one of these bonds here in the ethylene molecule, and then when they reform, they all link together end to end to make these chains of tens of thousands of these molecules, which make the polythene this substance here. That's not the only way in which we could persuade these little units to join together in these long strings. Or, of course, if they got more than two points of attachment in solid bodies. It can be done chemically. There are certain molecules, chemical molecules, which 
favour the breaking of the links and their reforming again. Sort of spanner molecules that undo the uh, screw uh, and uh, 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 screw it up again. And these spanner molecules then, uh, if you add them to a substance which can become a plastic, turn it into a plastic. That is why one can do so many things with plastics. For instance, one can cast them. You can put in the um, simple molecules as a fluid, add the plasticized plasticizer, and it turns it into a solid plastic. And you may be familiar too with some of these charming varieties of modern glue, which you have in two tubes. Both are quite fluid. Mix them together, uh, stick them on between whatever you're sticking together, and in 24 hours, they turn into a solid. Uh, very useful in the household for putting handles onto knives and mending the crockery and uh, mending holes in uh, uh, buckets and so on. Well, we're going to make a plastic. Mr. Coates here has two liquids. One of them can form the plastic, the other is the plasticizer. He will pour them very carefully into this beaker so that the plastic forming liquids below and the plasticizer, which is rather lighter, rests on top. Where they touch, they immediately make a plastic. You can probably see a little white film between the two. Now, if Mr. Coates takes hold of this film with the tweezers and gives it a pull, it will start coming out. And of course, as it comes out, it bears the surface between the two liquids and immediately more plastic is formed there. So if we do this carefully, we can take the plastic, lower it down, and after a while its own weight will keep it going, and we've made a little plastics factory. Now I'm going on to the other class of body I mentioned at the beginning of these, this talk, rubbers. Because rubbers, in many ways, are similar to the plastics. We've know all about rubber so well that perhaps we forget what an extraordinary substance it is. Other bodies, of course, show elasticity. Uh, a piece of wire is elastic, you can pull it out a little bit. But it's nothing like this property that one can take a piece of rubber and pull it out to several times its own length and it springs back again. And as you might guess, this kind of elasticity is quite different in its nature from the elasticity of a piece of wire. What is its nature? Why does it work like this? It's because this rubber, which is composed of long chains, like other plastics, has chains which are wriggling. And things are shorter when they're wriggling than when they're not. It's as simple as that. We can illustrate the nature of the rubber again by this model we used for polythene. Though the actual chain in rubber is somewhat more complicated. And you must imagine these chains in the rubber quite free from each other, able to wriggle about in any way they like. Except that at intervals, there's a kind of anchor or bond between neighboring chains. Generally, a sulfur atom. That's why you vulcanize rubber. And the more attachments you put in, the harder it becomes. A vulcanizing sulfur atom. The consequence is that this rubber is a mass of these long chains anchored together irregularly at certain points. Now here I've got my model neatly straight. But because of temperature again, it won't stay straight like that. It'll wriggle. It, and wriggling makes it shorter. I illustrate that with a model which I've got over here. My model is a number of little snakes made of chain. Now, I put them all here straight on this table, and they're as long as they can be. 
But if I give them heat motion, which I can do by beating on the table, you will see, it's a very simple point, that they naturally will go curly, and when they're curly and wriggling, they are very much shorter. Now, we'll warm them up gently at first, and then put on the full heat. So you see now, they're all in this wriggly form, very much shorter than they were before. Now here is a model, a rather more sophisticated kind, but one which I think illustrates quite well the nature of the rubber, the way the wriggling of these chains makes the rubber shorten. It's a series of linked arms with weights on them, so that if it's spun round, those weights uh, by centrifugal force are thrown outwards. Now you see this is now quite cold as it were, it's got no heat motion on it, but if Mr. Coates gives it a heat motion by spinning it, you see we've made it quite springy now. So you must think of that as what actually happens in the rubber. These chains of the rubber are wriggling normally, and so the rubber is short in its normal form. If we take a piece of rubber and pull it out, we're pulling those chains straight. Heat motion is always trying to make them wriggle again, so as soon as we let go, the rubber contracts. And that's why, of course, it contracts over such an enormous range. Now, uh, here is a little phenomenon which perhaps uh, makes this more real. Uh, rubber if you suddenly extend it, heats. You see, if we take this model, to go back to my centrifugal model again, if we take this model, get it rapidly spinning, and then pull it down, all the energy of the model is confined to a smaller space because we've shortened the distance of these weights from the axle. Therefore, that energy becomes much more violent in other words, if the rubber chains are wriggling and we pull it out, we make them wriggle more violently and therefore do what we call making the rubber hotter. Watch this now again to my model. Mr. Coates will spin it. Now as I pull it down, you'll see they, 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 they go much more violently. Now I want you to try that experiment for yourselves. The apparatus is only a little bit of rubber like this, a sort of rubber one uses uh, for one's stationary, an elastic band, in fact. Now, watch rather carefully how I do this experiment, uh, because uh, you have to do it just the right way. Uh, one's forehead is quite a good thermometer. If you lay that rubber band on your forehead, it's at room temperature, you really don't feel very much. Now, just lay it lightly on your forehead and suddenly pull it out and you see it goes much hotter. Now, hold it away and let it cool down a little bit in the air, it, keeping it extended, lay it again on your forehead, and suddenly let it contract. You will see it goes quite cold. Try it for yourselves. I think that's a good way of convincing oneself uh, that rubber is composed of these wriggling chains. Now that the secret is known, now that we realize how nature has made a substance like rubber, chemists, of course, have learnt how to do it uh, artificially. And for many purposes nowadays, the rubbers that are used are not the natural rubber from the rubber tree, but they're ones that the chemists have made artificially. And they can really make much better rubbers than nature can. Uh, if you see uh, this ball here, is made of ordinary natural rubber. This ball here is one of these synthetic rubbers, and this one wins. So, that's what always happens, of course, when one learns the way things work, and one is able to make them work in a better way. <laughs>